production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, the glass of Dale Chihuly illuminates the latest production of the Columbus Symphony. For me, this is equivalent to a psychological thriller. And we'll cruise on over to the Wexner Center to check out the latest installation from artist LaToya Ruby Frazier. This show is about the concept of unity, of solidarity, of class consciousness. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. For our first story tonight, we're going behind the scenes with the Columbus Symphony as they prepare to stage Bella Bartok's iconic opera thriller, Bluebeard's Castle. The story is inspired by the legend of Bluebeard, a wealthy and powerful nobleman who is presenting his castle to his new bride for the first time and revealing mysterious secrets behind every door. This crossover of music, light, and sculpture is a feast for the senses. Here's more. Well, for those of you that aren't familiar with Chihuly's work, um, he's an artist based in Seattle, Washington, um, most recognized for an artist who works with glass, also working on monumental scale. Well, it all came about in 2007. And it was really the brainchild of Gerard Schwartz, who was the, the director of the Seattle Symphony at the time. And so um, Dale was challenged with the design of, of presenting these wonderful sets that's part of this amazing opera. And he took on the challenge. And it was initially intended to be a one-time performance. And we're now on nine cities and 30-plus performances. It's all shipped across the country from Seattle here to Columbus and then our team comes out and builds everything working with the the symphony team here erecting the actual doors the sets and then our team actually puts all places all the glass onto the platforms. I think I could probably pretty safely say that uh, it's once in a lifetime opportunity to be part of such a project because you have so many different components because you have the art which is spectacular the the glass art of uh, Dale Chihuly and of course uh, the most important element for me is the music it's it's a, it's an opera only for two people uh, and the art here really becomes a part of the story and uh, each of these pieces uh, uh, correspond to a door that is being opened you're seeing Chihuly's interpretation of what Bluebeard is um, revealing to his new wife, Judith, as she goes into the castle and opens these secret doors to his past. I'm playing the title role of Duke Bluebeard. He's known to kill all his wives, like pretty much every wife that uh, he marries and takes into the castle, she never really comes back alive. With each door that appears, or with each door that opens, one more clue about Bluebeard is revealed. Each represents a different part of uh, Bluebeard's history, or it's a little bit dark. There's his gardens, his armory, his treasury, so I don't want to give too much away. From there on, there is a very interesting turn of the events, and uh, uh, you know, the ending is absolutely beautiful. For me, this is equivalent to a psychological thriller. It's just it has a, it has a different feel of uh, what the stage looks with, uh, with real art. These are not sets. Because normally when you're in an opera, it might look beautiful from the audience point, but you go on the back and then you see this, uh, you see the back of the sets and it's, it's not necessarily that poetic or interesting. But these pieces, this is the real art. They're sculptures, like no matter from what side you look at it, they are absolutely perfect. You know, you're drawn into this amazing opera and the way that the sets reveal themselves and then you get this wow, amazing color 
I, I just think it's incredibly dramatic and it, it's unique. There's nothing else quite like it. Our next story takes us to the Wexner Center, where you can see the very last Chevy Cruze that rolled off the assembly line at the General Motors plant in Lordstown, Ohio. It's part of an installation by artist LaToya Ruby Frazier, who spent months documenting the lives of workers who were impacted by the plant's closure in 2019. Here's a peek into the exhibit that builds on the long legacy of documentary photography in the U.S. My name is LaToya Ruby Frazier and I'm a visual artist that has a specific practice in photography. I'm mentored and trained by artists that use the camera to make social commentary on the United States, our history. I grew up next to Andrew Carnegie's first steel mill, the Eckerd Thompson plant, in Braddock, Pennsylvania, right next to the Monongahela River. So because of my upbringing and my grandmother raising me next to Andrew Carnegie's steel mill, I'm very sensitive towards working class people, communities, and their families. And I'm also sensitive to the impact of economic policies or when corporations abandon communities and people lose their jobs. The work here that's on view, the last cruise, that was nine months of shooting. Um, because the work focuses on the stories of the people from Lordstown, Ohio, where the GM plant was being unallocated. I knew that mass media wasn't going to do justice to allowing us as a general public to hear directly from these auto workers and union members and their children as to what this unallocation meant to them, what that word meant to them, and then leading up to that last cruise, rolling off the assembly line, and then also after. So um, LaToya spent a lot of time in Lordstown, Ohio, about nine months, um, meeting the people and hearing their stories. Where I then, opposite of a journalist, developed a very intimate relationship with the United Auto Workers of Local 1112 and 1714. So this is very different from photojournalism because you're not supposed to get so intimately and emotionally and psychologically involved. You'll see and hear from them what the UAW has done for this country in terms of your eight hour work week, your lunch break, your time off. Americans will be confronted with remembering like, oh, this is the union, this is the labor union that did this. This show is about the concept of unity, of solidarity, of class consciousness. And the only way to remind people of that is when you take a slow look through portraits and interviews of people. Um, and those are actually presented on, um, we've been calling it a kind of armature, but it, it replicates what the automobiles, what the cars go through in the factory. And so it's actually about the same shape and size and color as what you would see in the actual GM factory. And she's used that as a way to, to bring the kind of factory feeling into the exhibition. And most Americans have never seen inside of a car plant and how it's manufactured and how it's built. And so I wanted to bring that presence of the assembly line to the viewer. Also, the fact that this exhibition specifically has the real last cruise is monumental. And that's why this body of work, it's a memorial and a monument. The space is designed so that it's half holy, half assembly line. When viewers are in it, they're gonna feel that energy and that spirit. And it allows them to see the actual compact crew sedan where the workers who are all in the photographs are the ones that meticulously made it with their bare hands. Um, LaToya thinks that's really important, that this is a work of art and that these people who built it are actually artists. And I think what's a direct interesting intersection for me as a contemporary artist 
is that the UAW actually represents all the workers at the Museum of Modern Art. So that's a direct connection that I think is exciting for the art world to actually have to acknowledge. This exhibition really does show and it proves to Ohio, all the way to Washington, D.C., that artists play an enormous role in society. So this is the power of photography's ability to bring sight and vision and insight and a fuller breadth, a larger picture of the systemic, social, cultural, and political issue that is at stake, that is still unfolding and impacting the state of Ohio. The Last Cruise is on view at the WEX through April 26th. Visit WEXArts.org to learn more. The Dayton Contemporary Dance Company, known as DCDC, is one of the oldest modern dance companies in Ohio. It was founded in 1968 to create performance opportunities for dancers of color, and they have been delighting audiences around the world ever since. And last year, the dance world came to Dayton when the company hosted the International Gathering of Black Dance Professionals. Here's their story. The Dayton Contemporary Dance Company has a broad audience, individuals who love arts, and culture, creativity, and experiencing what I call the African-American story from the soul. The Dayton Contemporary Dance Company was started in 1968 by Geraldine Blunden. My mother, Geraldine, started this company and built it because really there was no place for African-American dancers to really train here in this part of the United States. When you think of dance companies, you think of dance companies existing in coastal cities. And she was very adamant about the fact that one could exist here in the Midwest, where people only thought there were cows and cornfields. We are a performing company that tours, and we also offer educational activities from K through 89 but we are rooted in the African-American experience, which means we perform dances of that culture, of that conversation. DCDC's history is rooted in the Civil Rights Movement. It's about the African-American experience. And now as the world is becoming multicultural, it's relevant to, the, to today. DCDC is the artistic uh, exploration of multicultural reality. If you like high energy, it's the place to go. This is not some lullaby. This is very high energy dance. And it's very easy to digest. And it's very powerful. And one walks away from a performance feeling great. I started dancing with the company when I was 12. So I sort of grew up as the company grew up. I started choreographing when I was 15 or 16. So there's always been a place to grow and be nurtured here. As we move through this 50th anniversary and I start to think about what the future holds for us, I still want to hold fast to those things that make us us. And that's a very, very nurturing environment. The roster of dancers for DCDC's first company come from all over the world. Dayton is home for every artist that joins this company for whatever length of time. So what they do and who they are doesn't just live inside of the studio space. I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. A really good friend of mine had previously danced for DCDC, and he talked about them a lot. So he put DCDC on my radar, but then when I saw them dance, uh, it, it, it put me like, head over heels, I was like, this is my next spot. If I don't get here, I don't know what's next, but I have got to get into the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I saw DCDC do the wonderful concert dance that they do, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's a really big deal. Like, this is really amazing. So I took the next year and a half after I met DCDC to prepare myself for coming to audition. 
Being able to host a large conference like the International Association of Blacks in Dance during our 50th anniversary is a great opportunity to just allow people to experience DCDC -DC and to experience Dayton. IABD stands for the International Association of Blacks in Dance. Five dance companies, we call them the Founding Fives, they all came together and they wanted to create a platform where young dancers could come, audition, work, network, all under one roof. DCDC was one of the founding member companies. There were five of them, Dane Contemporary Dance Company, Dallas Black Dance Theater, Philodanko, Lula Washington, and Cleo Parker Robinson. So IABD is now this consortium of black dance, of black dance companies, black scholars, black artistic directors. And every year, we all get together and there's a conference and festival. And it's like a family reunion. And it's just four days of being with people who know what you're going through. And it's always an experience that revives and refreshes you. We had a youth performance and a collegiate performance. We had an audition for summer study for dancers, and the takeaway was over half a million dollars in scholarships that were offered to those young dancers. The Onyx performance was the crown jewel of the weekend because it showcased the major African-American dance companies from across the country. Lula Washington's piece, Fragments, Lula is a self-bred choreographer, and Lula creates work that sparks her emotional id, no matter what it is. And I think Fragments talks about that. I think the piece is created in a way that it can have modules added onto it as other things pique her curiosity. Movement is our language, like words are a writer's way. Movement is how we connect with our audiences, and Fragments was a perfect example of that. Philodenko performed Endangered Species, the piece that was created by Anthony Burrell, and it was one of the most incredible works of dance that I've seen in quite some time. Clearly, he tackled a social ill and a social problem in that work, but the way it resonated in those dancers' bodies for the performance of that work, it should be seen everywhere. People ask all the time, what is different about black dance? And I think it's the energy and the perspective and how we can reach out there and grab your heart and twist it in your chest if you'll just sit still long enough and come support us. And Endangered Species was the prime proof positive example of what that kind of work can do. People have said that they feel something when they watch the company, that there's like a spiritual connection that they can feel. I know that the first time that I saw DCDC, DC, I also felt the same way. The atmosphere that the organization sets allows us to be our full selves and allows us to be artistically liberated so that when we are on stage, there's this real sense of dancing from the heart and giving with nothing to prove but everything to share. We try to think about that as we are performing and I think that people receive that. I'd like to believe that with all of the other innovations that have happened in the soil of the Miami Valley, DCDC DC is a part of that. Arts and culture really touch the soul. I think we are proud to be from Dayton. We're here, we are rooted here, and I'm hoping that we'll be here for another 50 years. You can learn more about the Dayton Contemporary Dance Company and find out about their upcoming events and performances at dcdc.org. Finally tonight, a visit to Clintonville, where we meet up with Bill Cohen. He spent more than 40 years reporting for Ohio's public radio and television stations, covering important issues of government and public policy. 
But when he wasn't using his voice to report current events, he was using it through music and song to encourage listeners to remember headlines from the past. As a child of the 1960s, he came of age during civil rights protests and anti-war demonstrations. His love of folk music and social justice led him to create his Spirit of the 60s coffee house, where he shares music and memories of the era that helped define him. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned our government must be strong. It's always right and never wrong. Our leaders are the best of men. We elect them again and again. I grew up uh, in Bexley, uh, and that's where I went to school, you know, elementary school and high school, and uh, until I went away to college. I went to college in 1966 until 1970. I spent virtually my whole time, my whole four years at Northwestern, doing two things, studying to try to get good grades, and protesting the war in Vietnam. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. When I got to Northwestern, just north of Chicago, in the late 60s, the place was exploding. I mean, there, there were black activists, civil rights activists, anti-war protests, women's liberation activists, uh, gay rights activists. There, it was just, you know, uh, it was really, it was exciting. I mean, everything was happening there. In restless dreams, I walked alone. A few months after I graduated, I got a, a four-hour-a-day job at WOSU Radio. A few years later, after five years of doing local reporting, I went down to the State House, started covering the State House, and uh, I, I was part of the bureau that fed the stories about state government and politics to all the Ohio public radio stations. And so that that whole thing lasted, you know, 40, 40 some years. Come gather round people wherever you roam. Although I had really strong views when I was young about the way th the world should operate, the way government, what government policy should be, very quickly I decided the reporter's job is not to espouse, it's to report and let the public decide, let the public radio listeners and the public TV viewers, let them decide who's right. Give them all the facts. That's the role of the reporter in a democracy. I retired in the spring of, of 2013. Covering all these issues and politicians has been, at various times, frustrating, intriguing, energizing, and even fun. It's been a joy doing this for a living for so long. Thanks for listening and for supporting Public Radio. Bill Cohen at The Ohio Public Radio State House News Bureau. And now I have a lot more time to do all the things that I was already doing before. Uh, but now I have a lot more time to do them, and and singing and performing is is one of those top things. The 1960s coffee house thing, I've been doing that about 28, 29 years. I call the show the spirit of the 1960s, because what I'm trying to evoke there is that yes, yeah, it was sex, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but that wasn't what I think is the important part of the 60s. My theme is that the 60s were important because people stood up. They stood up, they risked their jobs, they risked their freedom. Some people risked their lives, and some were killed, protesting for civil rights, protesting for human rights, uh, protesting for women's liberation, and especially opposing the war in Vietnam. So I kind of wrote a script that kind of, you know, takes people through the era. An unknown author named Betty Friedan writes a book called The Feminine Mystique. And then I also do trivia questions. People, people love trivia questions. This white TV comedian ran an imaginary campaign for president in 68. Pat Paulson. Well, the last 15 or 20 years that I've been doing the show, I've made it into a fundraiser for the Mid-Ohio Food Bank. I think it's a nice fit between the theme of, well, let's make it a better world. People try to make it a better world in the 60s. Let's, let's enjoy the music and the memories, and let's also get a little money to the food bank. And thank you, stars, for the roof that's over you. One, two, three. 
That's our show. You can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our free WOSU mobile app. Be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're taking you out today with music by Driftmouth. You can catch them live in concert on Saturday, April 11th at Roomba Cafe. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here next week. The old tree-lined homestead is bathed in a cool indigo. The low pines cast shadows that cut through the tall grass and creep up the pale gravel road. The old bar room where the bottle wouldn't leave you alone. The old man collapsing, they grab for your set. Well, they're leaving, they ain't going home. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.